Hi. So I am Anne-Maria DeMars. I am president of Seven Generation Games. I'm also a professor in the Department of Engineering and Computing at National University. At, I, at many years ago, taught at Minot State. I also taught at the University of Jamestown in North Dakota. I taught at Chankeska Chicana Community College, Pepperdine University. I've also taught middle school. So all the way from middle school kids to doctoral students. And math is one of the things I love in life. So I thought I was going to be this time of year, traveling around, meeting teachers in person, it's in places like Pure North Dakota and Minot. But instead, as my cousin, who's a fourth grade teacher said, in this new normal, it seems like we are expected to be able to teach remotely, if that's what our district decides to do, or be able to teach in person in the classroom and have lessons prepared for both those scenarios or be able to teach blended with half the students in the classroom and half of our students at home. Maybe while riding a unicycle and juggling alarm clocks. And did I mention that the school is on fire and your desk is on fire and everything might change overnight? And if this is the case for you, and you feel like this is what's being asked of you, believe me, you are not alone. Because nobody signed up for this. You know, I, like I said, I used to teach middle school, and no, nobody who teaches middle school or elementary school signed up to be teaching remotely. They didn't expect that they were gonna be switching from one scenario to another, from in-person learning to, to remote learning practically overnight. And in fact, uh, when I, I have many friends who were told on a Thursday, oh, come Monday, all of your kids could be learning from home. So this is not the deal that we expected when we became teachers. And the research base for what I'm gonna talk about, thankfully funded by the US Department of Agriculture and the National Science Foundation, started a long time ago, <laughs> about eight years ago, when we were funded through the US Department of Agriculture to develop these games and test their effectiveness. And then my research team, Maria Burns Ortiz, who you just met, Juliana Taken Alive from Standing Rock, and I were all part of this National Science Foundation Innovation Corps. And earlier this year, in January and February, in what seems like a completely different universe and century, we went to 27 cities in seven states and talked to 124 educators, all of them from Title I schools. And our charge from NSF was to identify what is it that they could fund that would help raise math achievement in these schools. What instead, and everybody we talked to says it's about damn time because what they said is instead of funding one more dime of research, before we do that, we're gonna send you people out and actually ask teachers and ask administrators what they need instead of coming up and saying, here, here's our thing. Don't you like our thing? We made a thing. So we did. And here's what we found over and over. that teachers said, administrators said, they need to accommodate student differences in ability. That when I taught eighth grade, I had kids from the second grade level in math to the eighth grade level. And you need to teach all those kids in one classroom. Now, given the current situation, they, it's more crucial than ever to be able to accommodate student differences in access to the internet. Some students have computers at home, some don't. Some have reliable internet, some don't. Particularly in schools that had a large proportion of indigenous students, Latino students, African-American students, they felt it was super important to integrate the student's culture in the curriculum. They wanted standards aligned curriculum. One of the dumbest things I ever heard an hour of my time, I will never get back, and I'm trying not to waste yours like this, was when somebody who, with daddy's money, let's be honest, started a startup in ed tech and was going to teach math. And one of the teachers in the audience raised her hand and said, excuse me, but it seems you have no experience in education. Where are you qualified to develop something to teach math? How do I know where this fits into the curriculum? And he said, oh, it's just K through 12 math. Anybody can teach it and teachers can figure out where it goes. Well, most teachers don't feel that way. They want, if they're teaching fourth grade math, to see where 
this software, this curriculum fits into that, what standards are being taught by this activity. They don't want to have to spend their very limited spare time figuring it out. Especially now, teachers need the ability to monitor student performance when learning from home. And I'll get into this in detail shortly. They want to maintain student engagement when learning from home, and this has become a super big problem. And whether kids are learning at home, whether in the classroom, they need to maintain engagement of all the students when teaching in a small group. So if I'm working with Jose and Damaris over here on adding fractions with unlike denominators, I need my group of kids over here that are supposed to be doing something on fractions with common denominators to be on task and not be saying, uh, Miss, Miss, Dr. Rousey, um, um. So that's what I need. And we heard over and over that, and we saw this many times in the schools we're visiting, that there's a need to maintain student engagement despite trauma at home. We talked to so many administrators, teachers who are concerned about students who are hungry, students who are homeless, students who were in families where family members were addicted. And for those students, it's really hard to come to school and focus on division with remainders when all that's going on. So those are the needs that we identified. And the challenge was to identify the optimal situation for online blended and in-class learning and make those situations as much as possible available for every teacher. So what I did in this case is what I've done in other cases, and it's a great thing to do, is before I started putting anything together, I went and I looked at the very best, most effective teachers I do that were doing the absolute best job and said, well, what are these teachers doing? So here's one example. This teacher has 17 years experience teaching math. He has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and a PhD in Education. So if anybody was gonna be prepared for setting kids up to learn from home, it was gonna be him. He also, from a personal perspective, he only has to do lesson plans for one class. He only teaches eighth grade algebra all day long. He doesn't have any children of his own at home. He has a 10 minute walk to school. The only after school activity he does is math club. And while that's relevant is because whether teachers should have to spend all their evening and weekend time preparing lesson plans or not, the fact is some people have more time available to that than others. They're not coaching track practice after school. They don't have their own three children to take care of. He also is in a district where 90% of the students take the ACT and their average score is in the 30th percentile. So it's certainly not a high performing district, but I've certainly been to places where they had more issues. Now here is one week of his math class and he did this every week. You can see that he did for every single lesson, two lessons. So two lesson plans for everything. If you have online access, there was three times a week, a virtual meeting, there were online lessons, that they could complete. If you didn't have internet access, here's what you should be doing in the textbook. Here's your, your assignments you should be doing. So for every lesson, two lesson plans, online access, offline access. He did three Google Meet sessions every week. And if you're teaching online, I had a friend ask me my advice because I've taught online for many years at the graduate level. And one piece of advice I would very strongly recommend, record your sessions. If you teach middle school students, they will oversleep. <laughs> I have um, a friend who teaches middle school history and she said she does her Zoom lessons 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. because if kids are not coming to school, they will sleep in. It also allows your students to play them over if you have students who are limited in English proficiency, if they just math is not their thing, they can play it over, they can watch it in bits. So record your lessons. So he has three Google Meet sessions each week recorded. He also has supplemental videos recorded. So if, if his explanation of irrational numbers caused you problems, he still can, um, you could still watch these three other videos that maybe explain it in a different way. There's lessons from the textbook and practice problems that you can do online. He assigns homework every day and grades all of it. 
And then he posts the answers step by step to the homework problem so students can see how to do it. So this would be a huge amount of work. He does this for every week, just for one class. Now you can imagine trying to do it for every class. And even with all of this, even with the absolute best case scenario, he had major problems. And the number one problem was this, the student just didn't do it. Even the very best teachers I know in the very best scenario had issues where from 20 to 25 percent of their students just didn't do the work. And the average teacher had far less participation than that. It's not all uncommon for me to talk to teachers where 50 percent or more of their students didn't hand in anything. And I know Maria is going to talk about that later in one of her sessions. The second problem was students cheated. And they cheated the old-fashioned way that not any of you of course but that students that, that i had cheated they copied each other's homework they called each other on the phone and asked how did you do question six and they just wrote that all down they also had modern ways to cheat like photo math which if you haven't heard of it is a math app where you can take a photo of a math assignment and then it will show you step by step how to solve it and all you have to do is attach your screenshot and send it to your teacher math homework done Mathway is another one like that. So those are two problems that he had, even with the very best case scenario. So our third problem now is how are we gonna enable this level of detail from teachers who have less experience, more classes to prepare, competing responsibilities in their life. I know plenty of teachers in the Great Plains who have a second job. I know lots of teachers who have two or three kids of their own at home. And, in all of this, how are we also gonna include students' language and culture? So I have solutions for these problems. And I'm going to cover four things. One is educational games. Another is games for decision-making to address those kids that have trauma in their lives. Data, because data drives a lot of things from funding to getting certain people off your back. And educational resources for teachers and parents. So that's a way to cover in the next 20 minutes or so. So how can games solve all of these problems? Let's look at some examples. This was our most popular game up until this summer when Fish Lake took it over. So and that's our second most popular game. So can you see this, Maria? Speak up and let me know. Can you see this? Yes, I can. Okay, and then let me know if you can. Uh, so first thing, I'm gonna play as a new player. I am going to enter a username. So here's one thing about participation and cheating. You know it was me because I had to actually log in with my username and password. Now you could maybe get your friend to do it for you. So that's, we can't completely eliminate cheating, but we can cut it down. So number one, you have to log in with your own username and password. So I know that it's you or at least somebody with your username and password doing it. It has been a journey of many moons. The journey has not been easy, but we have covered so much ground. New challenges will lie ahead only a few months from now. But for a moment, let's celebrate the accomplishment we have just achieved. There were times when it seemed as though this day would never come, that we would have to keep going forever. But the day has finally arrived. Today, we are making camp. Just so you know, that powwow dance is an inside joke. I was at Spirit Lake at Tadatoba Elementary, and we did this dance that looked like the dance moves from the Egyptian, and all the kids were there. The tribal historic preservation officer was there, and the kids were all in on the joke, and we showed him this, and he says, is that what powwow dancing looks like, children? All the kids nodded their heads. <laughs> You should have seen his face. And finally, we told him it was all a joke. But anyway, so one of the things you'll see right here that comes up when we talk about that engagement is when you're in a classroom and you're trying to teach and you have some kids over here that are either advanced or they're, they need some remediation and they're working on one thing and they keep calling to your attention, Miss, how do you play this game? How do you log in? How do you do this? And because of that, because all of these games were developed with research in classrooms, one of the things you'll see in Making Camp is at the very beginning, it tells you how to play the game. 
So whether you're in school... Or- Over 1,000 years ago, the Ojibwe moved across the North American continent. They traveled in search of a land that had been prophesized as part of the Seven Fires prophecy, a land known as the land where food grows on water. The Ojibwe made the long journey by foot without horses. It was a 2,000-mile journey that took roughly 500 years. After passing Lake Superior, the Ojibwe ended their westward journey around 1,400, almost 100 years before Columbus's ships landed on American shores. The Ojibwe lived in wigwams, dome structures built of branches, bark, and hides. Building a wigwam took days of hard work, cutting down trees, shaping branches, covering the structure with bark. By comparison, your work here will be easy. You will build your wigwam by completing challenges and earning points. Earn one point to get a wigwam. After that, click on the wigwam icon on the left at any time to come back here and trade. Once you've built your wigwam, you can customize it by earning more points and trading for more items. The more work you put in by doing challenge activities, the more quickly you'll earn points to deck out your wigwam. Summer will be over before you know it, and we need to be prepared for the months that lie ahead. Let's get started on making camp. So here's one example. We're trying to make it possible where their kids are learning in a classroom, where their kids are learning at home, for them to have the instructions presented to them without the teacher needing to be there. So this frees you up for time to work with other kids, or it makes it feasible for them to learn from home. And a really important thing I want to mention is these games can be installed on a device, whether it's an iPad, a phone. So if students don't have reliable internet at home, they can still use the games. You can, in fact, we're going to be doing a drawing at the end today of an Android tablet, and all the games will be installed on that and sent to you. So speaking of participation, here's two ways that we enhance participation. One is just because kids like to play the game. This is the most popular one. So it talks about how Native American tribes use dogs, what a type of sled was called. So it's teaching vocabulary. It's cross-curricular. I'll talk about that some more in a little bit. Every answer I give right. I get something for my dog. First here, I got a dog. I get to name him. This is kind of hilarious. You will see kids call their friends. What should I name my dog? It's like a a decision on the order of who you're going to marry. So for everything you do, you get another thing for your dog. You're also earning points down here. And those points can be spent as it said in the video, in your wigwam. So let's close this for a minute. Can you see my screen again, Maria? Maria? Yes, I can. Okay. I'm double checking because, you know, sometimes you end up, when, if you're on a phone call or something, you're saying something really brilliant, you're talking to your hand. So I'm just making sure you all can see. So. Uh, The advantage of of games like this, and this is just one example, is you can reduce cheating because students have to log in with their own username and password. It increases their participation because they're interested in doing it. You you can integrate culture and language, even if the teacher doesn't speak the language or isn't an expert on that culture. I certainly wouldn't know how you build a wigwam, but we had, as Annette brought up, cultural experts, subject matter experts that would tell us this stuff because don't believe everything you read on the internet. You could teach multiple subjects at the same time. And this is really crucial. As a teacher, in, I was expecting the eighth grade, like I said, I would have kids come in and they're at, at the sixth grade level, say, and I'm supposed to bring them up to ninth, ninth grade level by the end of the year. You're supposed to bring kids up more than one grade level in a year to get them caught up. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, one way is if you can teach multiple subjects at the same time, like that dog activity just kind of slid through, mentioned what a travoy is. You're teaching vocabulary, you're teaching social studies while they're learning math. You can automate grading. As you noticed, it told them, it told me if I was right or wrong about the math problems. And all of that goes into our database. You can track student time on task and we'll get to that when I talk about data. Now, here is a hill I will die on, okay? I have taught math everything from eighth grade to doctoral students. And I 100% believe that knowledge of multiplication and division is foundational. 
that knowing basic math facts like multiplication tables lets kids reason mathematically, understand divisions, the inverse of multiplication, understand the relationship between division and fractions. It lets them free up that cognitive energy. I don't have to be thinking three times eight, eight plus eight plus eight is 24. I, if I have that just off the top of my head, that makes it easier to solve those word problems. So I, I believe we all believe that multiplication, division, certain knowledge is foundational. And people have asked me in the past, well, couldn't you teach them math without them knowing they're learning math? Not exactly. Uh, it, we, it, it, there's just no substitute for repetition in things like learning your multiplication tables. And we probably, if you're my age, had our parents sit down with us or our grandparents in my case and go four times four is 16, eight times 12 is 96 and you had it banged into your head. There's no substitute for repetition. Fluency and multiplication and division comes through repeated practice. However, how do you get kids to do it? I know I have seen Maria's daughter, Amelia, lay on the ground and refuse, <laughs> refuse to study math. So, how do you get kids now that they're at home a lot of the times to do these repetitive tasks? Well, the answer is something I call variety and repetition. So if you look up here, for example, on the left with those cards, that's an activity for making camp premium where it's a memory game, where they have to uh, match up the math problem with the solution. So three times eight is 24 and they match the cards. The next one is a matching game. So you have two columns. And we have, you just saw the dog game. We have activities like on the left is an augmented reality app. I know Diana's gonna talk about that a little later today where you can have a card that has a math problem and they can use their phone or tablet, hold it over it and it shows up the answer to that math problem. And if they click on the button on the right, it plays the answer in, it plays the problem and answer four times nine is 36 in English. And on the left, it does it in Lakota. And we also have this in Dakota and we also have it in Spanish. So that's one way. Another way, there's a tic-tac-toe game in making camp premium and in making camp Ojibwe, where if you get it right, you get a rabbit. If you get it wrong, you get an empty snare. So we have lots and lots of options to practice the same content. The other thing that you can do through games is, as I said, cross-curricular. You learn social studies while you're playing the game. You can improve your reading. You have to read the instructions. You have to read the problems. One of the very best math teachers I know, or not, sorry, social studies teachers. He could teach math if he wanted to, he's brilliant. But one of the very best social studies teachers I know said this, that history is not just names and dates. It's how people lived, it's what they used, it's what they believed. Maybe if I'd had him as a history teacher, I would have gone into that instead of math. So here's an example from Spirit Lake. It's also in Spirit Lake, uh, Lakota, which is in, in English in Lakota. There's a Spirit Lake game as well. And in this part of it, you were attacked by rabid wolves. And because wolves have rabies and are very dangerous, they'll bite you more than once if they have rabies. There's a trivial fact for you. So you're chased up a tree and you are a kid. You can only hit a wolf about once every five times and there's seven wolves. How many arrows do you need? If you get it right, you can shoot the wolves. And we had a physicist program this. We had someone who actually goes bow hunting on the weekends, try it out. So it actually works identically to if you're shooting with a bow and arrow. Now we have nine games that teach multiplication, division, social studies in English, because like I said, there's that repetition. And also because, and I know Diana will probably talk about this later, kids are different. They have different preferences, so they can choose. And I say kids in grades three through five, because as any teacher knows, there's going to be a range in your classroom. So all the Making Camp series, the augmented reality apps and Spirit Lake are all focused on multiplication and division. One thing that games can be used for, whether you're in the classroom or you have students lear learning at home or you have students in a blended model is individualizing instruction. So students can proceed at their own pace. 
whether it's that student who is a little bit behind or students who are advanced. Again, games are appropriate at either end of the spectrum. I was that kid that was advanced in math when I was young. I, my own children did really well in school. They did really well academically. The behavior part, we'll discuss another time. But I've, I've seen this happen with my own kids. They, they get ahead and then they get more worksheets to do or they're just told, oh, we'll do the next chapter. So that's not very reinforcing. So if you tell them, great job, play these games on the computer, and this is my tricky mom slash grandma Jedi mind trick. You do what I want you to do and then you can do some more stuff that I want you to do. If you have children with special needs in your classroom, one of the things that you're required to do is provide age appropriate instruction. As if providing two or three lesson plans already was not enough, right? But what could be more age appropriate for middle school students than video games? So if you have a, a child in your class or your own child who is, say, at the third, fourth grade level, they can play these games in the classroom or they can play them at home to get caught up. Now, I encourage, I want to go back here. I, I encourage teachers and parents to have their children start with the earliest games. Even if your child is at grade level or doing really well, I tell them start with Spirit Lake, start with making camp series. First of all, I tell my, my judo kids, I also teach judo, but I tell them, you know, even Kobe Bryant, even Michael Jordan, even Shaq, all the best basketball players in the world practice free throws. If you're a really good mathematician, it's still good for you to practice that multiplication division a little bit. Also, they'll learn the cultural component which we don't, in my opinion, get enough of in school. They can learn math and social studies at the same time. And there are certainly worse things for kids to be thinking than, hey, this math is easy. So after they've gone through the first games, we also have four games that teach fraction statistics, social studies, and English. So those games are targeted at grades five through eight. And all of our games teach math in context. We all believe, at least in, in seven generation games, and we have a lot of research to back us up, that students are more engaged, leading to greater time on task, greater participation, greater retention of the information when math is taught in context. I've had students from middle school to graduate school say to me, when am I ever gonna use this? So when that context includes indigenous history, students are learning multiple, multiple subjects at once, and they're also paying more attention. You're one of the, the smartest people I know, my friend Eric, we were walking through the grade school, the elementary school in the Spirit Lake Nation, and we ran into one of his grandchildren. And his grandson looks up at him. He must have done badly at a math test that day, right? And he says, Papa, I don't need to learn math because I'm an Indian. And Eric stops and he looks down at his grandson and he says, my boy, we were a nomadic people. We traveled all over these plains. Do you think we met up with another tribe and we said, ha, huh, what a coincidence, other Indians. He said, no, we estimated how long it would take us to get from one place to the next. We estimated how much food we would need to get through the winter. Did you see the plains filled with frozen, starved to death Dakota? No, you did not, because our ancestors were good at math. And so that's the kind of thing that I would have thought of like three days later. <laughs> I've always been impressed by Eric's ability to think on his feet like that. And it, our math is taught in context like that. So you're going fishing. Is the fishing worse than it was last year? What proportion of the fish, what fraction were over foot long, good enough to eat and not throw back? So let's see how that works.
you can see with a game like this, students are motivated to pay attention because they want to play the game part. All of our math problems occur in the context of games. So in adventure game, players experience how Dakota, Lakota, the Ojibwe, the Maya or the Aztecs actually lived. Like in this game, Spirit Lake Beginnings Lakota, they can play in Lakota or English, and they have to go out and find herbs that will heal people who are, uh, are suffering in this epidemic, which is funny because we came up with this game several years ago. And it's, it's very timely now. And as Annette said at the beginning, we actually went and spoke to tribal elders in the Dakota Nation and said, if people were sick, what herbs would they use? And we gave pictures of those herbs to our artists and included them in the game. So it's what people used. It's how they really lived. And at the same time, they're learning math. So if you're seven eighths of the way from your camp, it's one eighth of the way back from the other camp where you're going to meet. There are a couple of things, speaking of research-based, that are integrated. One is direct teaching. I am a great believer that you do need to teach students directly, and we'll take a look at some examples of that in a minute. The other thing that I used to think, and some of you who are older, more experienced teachers will laugh at me now, but when I first started teaching, I thought the idea of multiple nodes, modes of instruction was just a fad. I thought it was something like pseudoscience, astrology, and for many years of studying what the very best teachers do, I have come to conclude that I was wrong about that. So we include activities for auditory learners, I'll get to them in a minute, um, visual learners. So we've got, for example, See if I can remember my username here. Probably not. Okay, we'll go in as a new player. I'm going to talk about usernames and passwords at the end. Aha. So let's take a look at one of my favorites. Can you, so can you see the Martin clan here? The Martin clan. Yes. One of the Ojibwe clans was the Martin clan. A tribe's hunters, warriors, and scouts came from the Martin clan. The Ojibwe viewed the Martin, an animal similar to the weasel, as being quick, agile, skillful, unafraid, and good at hunting. These same traits were associated with the members of the Martin clan, who were valued for being brave and skilled. And if you're a social studies teacher, I hope you appreciate our use of primary resources from the Library of Congress. Funny thing, we found little interactive things, just like being able to click on the answer or drag it. For those kids who are kinesthetic learners, make a difference. They just like it better. It, it fits with the way they like to learn. So let's take a look at one of the most popular videos. We track what kids do. And again, I'll talk about that when we get to data. And why we include what we include. One of the things that we found is that students often don't know the terms for things. That if we ask them, what's the product of four times eight? It's not that they don't know four times eight. They don't know what the word product means. So here's an example of direct instruction and also working with both auditory and visual learners. What's the word? Addition, subtraction, and multiplication terms. You're going to need math in the future. Knowing the right terms for math is essential. If a problem asks for the product of two numbers and you give the sum, it could mean you end up here instead of here. Oh, did we mention that here is also inhabited by zombies? Knowing what difference means can make all the difference. Addition. Sum. 
When you add numbers together, the answer is called the sum. It doesn't matter what those numbers are, whether it's 15 plus 10, or 9 plus 2, you can see we've or 2,000. Offerings for students that learn at an auditory and visual mode best, for students who learn in kinesthetic mode best. And one last thing I want to show you about this is one way of us preventing cheating. We need to build a wigwam for the winter. Each wigwam takes 10 to 16 poles made from cutting down young trees called saplings. We also need to strip the bark from trees for the outside of the wigwam. If we take too much bark, it will kill the tree. What do you picture when you hear the phrase Indian trading? Is it something like this? In fact, the northern and southern tribes traded with each other for thousands of years. People also traded within tribes. In this game, you earn points by learning. You could trade those points for everything you need to set up camp. And why did we do this again, even though at the very beginning there was an instruction video that explained how to do this? Because we have worked with children. <laughs> And we know that they don't always listen to the instructions the first time. So they can't keep going here until it explains to them, this is what you're going to do in this activity. So again, an example of your kinesthetic learners, I can keep shopping. This is also one way to encourage students to play the games as opposed to having their friends give them the answers because you earn the points and you can spend those points in here. So now I've got my wigwam, I've got items in my wigwam. I can move them around. Anything I click on tells me information about how this was used. This particular game is Making Camp Premium, which is focused on Ojibwe. There's a, a Making Camp Lakota as well. Bazoo. So that's an example of how we use the games to address the interest of students, whether they prefer to learn through auditory, visual, kinesthetic, how we include culture in everything that we do, how we include incentives, whether it's playing the games themselves or getting earning items that you can then use. So let's look at, so we've talked a lot about About educational games, this also includes learning languages for students who English is their second language or Spanish or Lakota. So we offer games in multiple languages. And I'm briefly going to show you the games that we have for decision making. And this is something that is pretty much up to your discretion. For some schools, they have every school, every student use these games. Others think that this is not something that their teachers or their parents would be comfortable with. A lot of these games are used in therapeutic settings. So we have the Crossroads games and they cover topics like child sexual abuse, domestic violence. We have games for students who are a little older that cover things like drug use and driving, unsupervised parties. So let's just, we just take a really quick look at these. All of these links, are that are in the present are in the presentation and as Maria said at the beginning all of these presentations are going to be up on a website that you can go to so let's just take a look at one of these cool party it looks like everyone in town is here do you even know all these people your parents are out of town and you had a party it has gotten out of control what should you do next Come on, be cool. Everyone is having fun. Is that a rat? Worse, it's a gopher. We kind of have a gopher problem. You have one minute to get those gophers. Squash gophers by tapping them. So 
you can see, this is, follows the exact same model that we do with our other games, where there's a scenario you're presented with, a decision that you make, and then if it's correct, you get rewarded with gameplay, and if it's incorrect, then you are provided information on what you should have done instead. So, we looked at educational games, we looked at a lot of games, ways games are used, and then the question is, but are the children learning? And the amazing thing that we can do now is take a look at students. So I have my teacher dashboard. These obviously are made up students because we're not gonna show you people's information. And I can say, look at this student who's a hard little worker. Okay, it was me. And I can see that this student played the dog game. They earned 12 points there. That's a multiplication game. Magnets, they did two of those, two correct answers. Rabbit, tic-tac-toe again, multiplication. So it shows me how many correct answers the students did. It shows me which activities they did. So homophones, antonyms, I could tell they're doing these are all in, in English, idioms. These are in social studies. Then I can see they did the math match, multiplication, memory. So it shows me what my student's actually doing. This points is just how many points they have remaining that they haven't spent in their wigwam. And that's interesting because sometimes students will play the games over and over and over just because they want to play the games. This time on task, how do you know what students are doing? This tells me that this particular student played for 12 hours and 28 minutes total in 33 sessions. This student, also me, was a little slacker. Um, she got zero points and she only played for one minute in one session. So you could tell, are they playing or not? Let's look at a different one. So Fish Lake is a different, different game. We saw that a little bit. Um, I can look up an individual student. So I can do this if I'm a parent, if I have a license for the games. So this tells me, oh, Dennis is a hard little worker. He did this, this problem a whole bunch of times. He tried it twice. This was his answer, it was correct. Now, he was actually just doing this for this example. Normally, if they get it right, they would go on to the next one. So this was the answer he gave. Did he get it right the first time? No, he didn't. He had to do it twice. There's a hint that they can read that gives them an explanation. So did he read the hint, still didn't understand? No, he didn't. But that's okay because he got it right anyway. You can also click here and get information on the standards addressed in the game. So this will tell you the specific standard addressed by every problem. We also have similar reports for the decision-making games. And of course, we're not showing you any student data. This is me again. So this tells you what activities I did uh, that I didn't do the one on driving under the influence or unsupervised teen parties. I did the one on budgeting. There's situate motivational interviewing. It tells you the answers I gave. And if I had done the depression scale or the adverse childhood event scale, it would give my score here. So you can get all kinds of data. You can see what your students are doing, how much they're playing, what answers they gave. We also have additional resources for teachers and parents. I'm not going to go over that at great length because I know Diana is going to talk about it later. We have PowerPoint, so I'll just briefly show you those. PowerPoints, PDFs, if you want to cover anything from problem solving strategies to examples of how to do division. I frankly believe that a lot of students learn by multiple examples. So those are available for you. You can access them, modify them however you want. We also have a lot of videos. And I know, again, that's going to be covered later. So I just wanted you to know we have all those cultural videos, all the math videos. You can access them separately. From YouTube, you can include them in your own lessons. Remember we saw that teacher had assigned supplemental videos, so you can assign those to students. 
we have lesson plans. So we'll take a quick look at one example. This is on finding the perimeter. So it starts with the standards taught, tells you what you need, things anybody would have at home, probably a piece of paper, a pen, a phone. It'd be nice if you had making camp premium. Then they play this, watch this perimeter video. Perimeter. You've probably heard the word perimeter before. Maybe in an action movie or a show where someone's trying to do something, like protect a fort, and one guy says to another, we've got to secure the perimeter. And the other guy says something like, yes, sir. But what is perimeter? Perimeter is the distance around an object, whether so it's an army base on or on a computer perimeter and what it is. Then they get a table. If you're one of those super te teachers, you probably go out and, and have something printed out on Google Sheets or what. Me, I make the students write up themselves. So they have a table like this and they have the object, the length and width. You can do this in school, you can do it at home. You send them out to get measured 10 rectangles. If it's a blended learning model, you could talk about perimeter at school and then the day they're home, they go out and they go find their measurement. This is something, if you don't know, now you do, that every mobile phone app, you can, every mobile phone, you can either comes with a measure app or you can download one. And then they use, kids really like this, they use the measurement app to get the length and width. They watch another video, why? Because we believe repetition is important, but it's not the same video. It gives them examples and then they compute the perimeter. And then when they've done all that, they can play Making Camp, which also has some perimeter videos and activities. So variety and repetition. We also have tech support for anybody who has a license or just anybody who wants to email us. So you can go to the tech support site in Seven Generation Games. There's a special teacher site that Christy's gonna talk about this afternoon. Or you can get help from a human. Send it support at sevengenerationgames.com. We answer it within 24 hours. We have games that work offline. So if you have issues with your students having, not having internet access at home, or maybe in your school it's not that reliable, you can download them on the device. You just need to have internet somewhere so you can download them the first time. And the frequently asked questions, I'm just gonna go through two, and then I will be done at 11 o'clock exactly as planned. If you wanna play offline, we have multiple games for that. So that's a question. Use your names and passwords. I'm just telling you. Get the kids usernames and passwords. You can create them yourselves. You can have your students do it. Not recommended. I see their usernames. <laughs> or you can send us a roster if you have a school license or a classroom license and we'll send you the usernames and passwords. However you do it, make sure you keep a list because when, not if, your students forget their login information, you will have it. We keep no personally identifying information on your students. So we, we don't know who Dakota123 is. Um, so we're out of time in my presentation that you can take a look at online. We do have some ways that K through, two teacher, K through two teachers have used the games. They're not designed for that age, but teachers are amazingly creative. And so we have found teachers using Making Camp. Uh, with watching the videos as a class and playing the life section and then doing the wigwam activities a class. Teachers have used the Forgotten Trail graphic novel uh, to teach about Le Ojibwe legends. And there's the teacher cheats for that. So that is all I have to say for now. I have lots more to say, but it's 11 o'clock. You can hit me up on Twitter anytime. You can follow me on Instagram. You can email me. I would love to hear from you. And that's all I know about anything. Yeah.